or touch <laughs> that to that. Um, but uh, it's still, hopefully, hopefully still pretty entertaining. Um, it, it does actually have a, um, it does have a, a practical application, which I will get to. Um, but I also, it is kind of an intellectual game. How do you, how do you write a parser within a parser? And in, in this case, I'm using a, uh, uh, a push, I'm actually implementing a push down automaton inside the, inside the, uh, you know, the meta program. Um, so, uh, I'm relying on Eric and Abel to correct me on a couple of things, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, and uh, anyone just please jump in with any questions or, or comments. Um, uh, this should be pretty interactive, hopefully. Uh, so here's the here's the EDSL which I'm trying to which I'm trying to parse. I want to do these declarative uh, declarative angle bracket uh, languages. Uh, in particular, I want to do graph languages. So this looks a little bit like XML in a way, which <laughs> the brackets sort of uh, flipped. Uh, we want to we want to. Uh, uh, parse graphs that contain nodes. Nodes contain edges. Each each node with an edge has a name. All of these, of course, are types. Um, and in this case, they're just they're just empty tag types. Um, and so the thing the thing to remember here is that these, although they look sort of like meta functions, these are actually just tags that are going to be that are going to be parsed. Um, so here's a run of the parser. Um, it's just uh, um, you know, it's just specifying the. Actually, does anyone have a laser pointer? By any chance? Uh, okay. Um, so uh, it's gonna. Uh, so it has. It's using this parser, which which I'll show in a minute, um, and it wants to go start at this uh, graph nodes. State. It wants to use this data, and here's the uh, um, here is the ah, yes, this is the um, uh, this is just a meta function for fetching information about uh, the the DFA. Actually, I'm calling it DFA here, but it's really pushed out in Tom's Um Not as deterministic by name. Tom. Uh, 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 it's going to create an MPL graph out of it. So this is, as I talked about last year, I'm not really going to talk about it too much this year. Uh, but MPL graph is BGL-like uh, graph data structures based on MPL for uh, so a uh, So so generally, I wanted to also talk about kind of comparing these different EDSL things. So, uh, this, the one that I'm presenting today, is for these angle bracket expressions, and it also will, um, it also in theory will do round bracket expressions and combine, combined round angle bracket expressions. Um, they're all types. Um, so I, 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 part of my my point today is that the computation is equivalent to what Proto is doing, and what Metaparse is doing. Um, they're all, uh, they all can be thought of as push down automata. Uh, they're all, they're all implemented in quite different ways, but um, Proto is, is, is walking over expression, uh, abstract syntax trees, and uh, doing <coughs> recursive descent on that. Metaparts is doing recursive descent on uh, compile time strings. Yes. Sir. Sorry, I didn't quite understand the dip. You're saying angle brackets versus round brackets. Yeah. So, like, if we if if you look at this 
this is the language that I can parse right now. Um, I've also experimented with doing round rack expressions where they're actually functions oh, okay. or functions of functions of functions. Um, so this could be this could be a combination. And I'll actually I'll show an example from Proto where he's doing that. Um, yeah, it's a brown lambda notation that was uh, posted in the boost list years ago. Yeah, yeah. actually. So, so that the, the approach I'm using here will generalize to that pretty easily. <coughs> yeah. um, so, um, so again, so there's these there's I'm sort of saying that these three libraries are sort of equivalent. Um, I think there's slightly different power of things because so now is is proto um, does it have backtracking? Is it, is it uh, non-deterministic? OK. So mine is actually deterministic. It's a little bit less powerful. Uh, but both Metaparse and Metaparse are, are non-deterministic because they use backtracking. Um, so the, the other way you do an EDSL is preprocessor metaprogramming. And I understand, I haven't done any of it, I understand that also is equivalent. It's also equivalent to a push down to Um uh, Difference is, if you really wanted to do a Turing machine, you could do it in template matter programming. You can't do that at all in the preprocessor. Um, but, um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But I think generally you don't actually want to parse things with the Turing machine because the languages are too complex for our little brains. Um, so here's, here is the EDSL in Angli for specifying grammars. And Angli uses, um, uh, you just specify a push down automaton directly uh, rather than a grammar. So the way this, so this is, this is pretty compact, I would say. I would say you can't, can't do too much better than this, at least for specifying an automaton. Um, so we've got states with transitions. Um, in this case, there's only one transition per state. But there could be there could be more. It would just try from uh, one to the next. Um, so a graph has. Uh, so when, once you're inside a graph, you're looking for nodes. When you see a um, a node uh, a start node template, then you're going to recurse into this uh, this rule, uh, pushing stuff on the stack. Um, when, you, when you're in when you're near on a node, you're expecting to see a name. Uh, you're not going to recurse on that one. So you assume it's stored. So each these are sort of semantic actions, which are at the held um, Then when we, so after after we see the name, we expect to see to start seeing edges. So here we have uh, the thing that's going to start looking for edges. Once it sees an edge um, tag, it's going to recurse to the edge name. Um, and these things get pretty messy pretty quickly. That's, that's um, I definitely want to improve the semantic action. Um, actually, since this is all functional programming, it would be more appropriate to use uh, synthesized attributes. So it'd be really nice to have an EDSL for just specifying attributes and how they're synthesized. Um, so I don't think I need to go into the rest. It's the um, same same idea. So it's gonna it's gonna push whenever it's whenever it matches one of these um, uh, or whenever there's a whenever the rule whenever the transition specifies a recurse rule it's gonna push a new frame on the stack um, and and these are the match things so normally it's just either always match or it's match if you see one of these what I'm calling a token which is which is really a um, a template so so what are the Parameters to that angry state template. Um, state a state just has a name and a bunch of transitions. Oh, oh yeah, there's oh, like no, true. true MPL vector and then a transition. Yeah, no, no, it's actually it's actually it, there's a bunch of optional parameters. So one thing that's nice about um, this parsing system is it's able to um, is it's able to match things and. and um, and skip over things. Um, so, so I think the next slide shows a little bit of how the automatons 
there. So this, <laughs> this, this starts to get EMS. This is the level which you should never have to see because this is actually the implementation of the, um, uh, the implementation of the EDSL for Atomica. Um, and uh, so, uh, does it show it here? Um, so, so, okay, so this is kind of raw uh, description of a, of a MDL graph. And, and so you can actually have multiple transitions um, for each, um, uh, for each state. And it's going to match, it's going to try to match them in order. So, um, this one, uh, shoot. So I don't, I don't have anything that shows it, but uh, there's a bunch of optional parameters for each, for each state. Um, so it's going to start with the name. Um, and uh, this is the this is the rule for um, for matching. This is the data that's going to be um, started with for uh, uh, um, so I don't I don't have that up at the moment, but um, but there's um, it's actually actually is equivalent of it. Oh, yeah, maybe that would be easier. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe that's easier. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to, um, I mean, it's basically the, the name of the state, then the, then the rule, then the data that it's using. Um, but these are all optional. So this is the part that I that I didn't want to do, um, that I wanted to hide as well as possible. <coughs> so this implements the ESL just directly as 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 um, as an MPL graph, and then this this is the one that runs on the. It, it, this is what you use to compile a grammar into a pushdown. <coughs> um, so that's the that's the worst part. But I want to just I'm actually showing. The entire code of my library in this in these slides is only about two or three hundred lines of code, so I would try to show the whole thing. So I thought I would give you a little break from from staring at angle brackets and talk about the theory a little bit. Um, so uh, as I mentioned briefly, there's um, you know this is this is the hierarchy of possible grammars. Um, what I want to emphasize here really is that it's just that. Um, Regular expressions are just finite fine state automatons. Um, and then once you add a stack to that, then you can parse context-free grammars. If you have two stacks or, or tape, um, then, you're, then, you've got, then you can get up into context-sensitive grammars and, and then just any kind of grammars. Um, and my understanding is that no one ever uses anything um, more complex than a context-free grammar for any programming languages, just because we, we can't, we have trouble enough just matching you know, brackets in our heads. So, um, <coughs> I don't know if there are any exceptions to that. Does anyone know of a language that uses a more complex grammar? <coughs> it's called C++. Yeah, it was good. It's okay. C++ is not at all context-free. It's, it's, it's close, though, right? It's context-free with some exceptions? Or? No, I mean, maybe you could say C is context-free with some exceptions. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I feel like it's just some some special cases added on to. Yeah, well, you know, it's all I don't know, two hundred special cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of, some of which you know require even two hands. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about the the expression versus declaration, I mean, yeah, you basically have to parse it once. 
Yeah. Okay. Or interesting things like figuring out which order your static constructors are called in. Well, it's not really parsing, right? You're right. It's not parsing, but it's a it's a real gotcha. Yeah. Part of C plus plus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm just covering uh, parsing in this. Uh, but um, so yeah, so my, my other point though is that I said it should make sense, right? You put all all these creators are, are really important in the interesting uh, context for that. Um, so the other distinction here. Uh, that you might, um, so there's two different major ways of actually implementing uh, a context free grammar, or a parser for context free grammar. Um, one is one is uh, recursive descent, one is a push down automaton. Uh, mine is, frankly, is, is, uh, is, is directly implementing push down automaton. Um, so, really, the difference is whether you're going to use the compiler stack or you're going to use. Uh, Explicit stack, I can use an explicit stack. Um, so, uh, so uh, when you when you want to implement non-determinism, um, if you're doing it with recursive descent, you can just uh, try try going in recursing on something. If it fails, then you can just try the next thing, and you just kind of and you just remember where you were. Or if it's functional, then you don't even it's pretty much automatic. Uh, you just know where you are. Um, so, Proto and Metaparse do implement backtracking, um, and they use the implicit stack of the compiler. Uh, Angle is deterministic, so this means it can it can uh, parse L one grammars, um, and it has an explicit stack. Now, somebody told me at one point that I don't know if this is true anymore, but that you don't want to do a whole lot of recursion. Blows up, so that's part of why I use uh, an explicit stack. And uh, Stephen, do you know? Uh, that? So you just even in that, just to evaluate, it, you have to use your own recursion recursion in your thing that's evaluating the. So you're just substituting one stack for it in the compiler for a different stack. Uh, I think this so no, I think this is not recursive. This is, is kind of continuations and and explicit stack state. Uh, so but when, so you instantiate one template and then that instantiates the next one, right? And, and then if you're using continuations, then that ends up being recursive, effectively. Oh I see. So it's not recursing itself, but it's But the, the data structures in the compiler will behave similarly. Yeah. So. Okay, so so it doesn't really save anything because in fact it's probably slower because you have yeah. an extra thing that you're maintaining on top of that. Okay, okay. In some ways I, I like the I like the style better, but it is actually I am actually considering moving to uh, to just recursive stuff. Um, but I, I just think about graphs all the time, so it was really obvious to me to implement a push down automaton. Um, but anyway, so. Here's here's how here's how Proto does its uh, recursive descent parsing. Um, so as I understand it, um, it's kind of a hand coded. Um, oh wait, let me start. Let me start with what it's doing, and then I'll talk. Just kind of keep going through. So so when when Proto uh, so I, this is an example of the um, of of implementing uh, the assign. Who's design? Yeah. So this is the, the map, uh, and so so uh, what Proto is doing is is uh, it's recursive descent. So it's going to it's going to check. So say we're say we're right here at um, at this token, and we're and we're trying to figure out what to do with this next part. Um, so it's going to try looking and seeing whether it matches a function. Um, and then it's going to try and see, is that a terminal? Well, no, it's not a terminal, because there's actually, um, because there's stuff after this, this, uh, uh, these uh, function uh, call that we're looking at right now. So that's going to, that's going to fail and then go on to this next one. 
so there's the recursion and a little bit of backtracking there. As I understood, this could actually recurse into some completely different rule, and that could and that could fail, and it would uh, that would be more serious backtracking. So this is just a a, a couple of levels of backtracking. So um, so it's kind of cooked. Continue on to this one and say, okay, so this matches uh, map list of which has three children. <coughs> Uh, one is the rest of the rest of the stuff. Actually, the matching happens in the reverse order. So, <clears throat> ah. the way um, the expression tree gets built up, you start yeah. with the map list of terminal, then you invoke a function of two arguments, and that creates a node that actually has three arguments. That is, you know, the object, you know, on which you're invoking the function call, yeah, and the two arguments to the function. And then you invoke it again and again, and you end up with a tree where the topmost node is going to have, you know, on on the left, it's very complicated. It's going to have all all this stuff. It'll have all that stuff, oh, right? And then this both those two will be the two children. Okay. Ah, okay. So you'll start matching there at the at yeah. the right. Yeah. Okay, that's way more efficient. So then, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's able to actually. Uh, immediately match this terminal, which is which is this. No, actually, that it, it it'll recurse down and eventually match that terminal. Ah, oh. is it recursing through through this though? Yeah, you, you can uh, check up there and explain what's going yeah, on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, if I had a, if I had a whiteboard, um, I could I could draw it. So this is an expression tree where uh, the the type of the node is function because it's a function in location. And the two children are terminals. And then uh, the, the first argument is all of this gunk. Right? And for all of this gunk, it's going to be a function node where uh, the, the second and third ar uh, arguments are children are, are terminals. And the first argument is, is all of this gunk. So it kind of it nests like that. And the way the matching happens is if you're if you're trying to match this grammar against an expression like this, it will say, "All right, am I a function? Yes. Is my first argument a terminal? No, because my first argument is going to be everything from here to here. Okay. So this fails, and you try this. All right. So is this a function? Yes, it is. Is uh, this from here to here match?" Map list of. Then you recurse. Yeah. And then you try this again. So uh, now the question is, right, is this a function? Yes, it is. Okay. Does the first child match map list of tag terminal? No, it doesn't. So now you have to recurse again. Right? And now this test is going to succeed because if this is your function, if you're only testing this. Now this guy, map list of, is a terminal of type map list of tag. So if this part matches, and then you pop out and you check this and this for this guy matches. And you pop out again, and you match this and this I'll over here, and that succeeds. Cool. Yeah. And then and the, as it goes, as it returns, it's, it's calling all this semantic action, uh, which are, I get this is the yeah. The media cell, which is yeah. Yeah. just going to function. Um, so, um, thank you, Eric. Um, the other, the other point I wanted to point out is that um, Eric's actually implemented an EDSL cell here. Um, I understand that a hand coded EDSL cell where, um, where the, all, each of these things like or and, and when are are implemented directly as um, as matches in uh, in template. So, um, and and he's using the uh, the round bracket expressions that I was talking about earlier um, for for function calls. Um, so, um, just what I wanted to point out that that my parser is sort of a generalization of of the hand coded EDSL parser, which. Part 
starts from there. Um, so, uh, again, this is a recursive descent parser working on compile time string. Um, and uh, so this is going, okay, so this, uh, Awo has, uh, has implemented uh, EDXL's programmers as well, but this is, this is the functional interface to uh, the parser. Um, so, uh, what, the way this one's gonna work is it's gonna, it's gonna uh, start with expression. It's gonna start, it's gonna skip these spaces and go into plus expression. Um, it, and so the way fold LP works is that it's trying to match first this parser and then any number of, uh, of this parser. And at each step it's gonna combine it using this uh, meta function. Uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna first reverse into uh, plus expression and then into prod expression. This in token is gonna match the one here. Um, and then it's gonna try to match the sequence where it's gonna look for either a, a, a multiplier divide. This plus doesn't match either of those. So this, this parser here, the sequence parser here is gonna fail. Uh, but the way the way Abo has implemented this, um, each meta function uh, is able to handle errors in the way that it wants. So this fold LP is okay with this parser down. It's just gonna return the value that was parsed here. So this returns to this point. Uh, and, now, and now we are looking for this sequence, either a plus or minus, this plus does match. Um, now I'm not clear how this space how this how is consumed by the token part. So you use plus token and it is implemented in a way that it matches ah. the plus and the spaces and it throws the spaces away. Oh uh, okay. So it's built into the, the plus. Okay, okay cool. Um, so it, it does match the it does match the plus and then um, and then it's gonna look for a prod expression. So it's gonna recurse looking at this two and prod expression, uh, two matches, multi matches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and, each, and at each step here, oops. So these are sort of the semantic actions, um, but actually it's just implemented as sort of a standard old, um, old parser. Um, so that's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, again, as I, as I mentioned, it's recursive descent, but backtracking, it's able to go into the, the parsers, and if they fail, then they find a good handle. <coughs> is this parsing tokens, or is there a level underneath that's actually, you said parsing strings at one point? Yeah, this is parsing compile time strings. So this is a, this is an example of its use. So, okay. So Abo has this, this um, that's macro, what which is going to convert yeah. this into an MPL string. Which is a um, LPL sequence of characters, and, and then it gets tokenized somewhere. So it's basically working on a, an MPL sequence of characters. Um, uh, so, whereas mine is working on an MPL sequence of types. So characters are the token in the case. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, int token consumes an integer, integer, and then it builds an integer value out of it as the result of parsing. And it, so this example calls it token because you get like a value, and then you can build more complex things out. So for completeness, I wanted to show almost my entire library in this talk. So part of my I don't know if there are any non-meta programmers in the room. I'm on a book. Part of part of my uh, so last last year I ended up showing a bunch of code and I kind of had people rolling on the floors because um, they weren't used to meta programming. So part of my part of my intent with this talk is to is to familiarize people with meta programming. So I want to show uh, the entire code. Um, this is actually just some, some utilities uh, that we're using to, um, 
to take apart templates. So this, this one will uh, just uh, strip out all the arguments and return a template. This is all very odd templates. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do any of this without very <laughs> many templates. This would make so much work possible. And also the, the abstractions that Eric identifies. Like, who would even have thought of doing parsing inside the compiler? <laughs> that wasn't me. I'm okay. Still those ideas. You still have um, So, uh, so these are the utilities that this one is just uh, stripping out all the arguments. Um, this one is is uh, taking the arguments and and uh, well, this takes takes just the arguments and converts them into an MPL sequence. Um, as we as as Eric talked about. Um, or actually, as Bartosz talked about, um, you, you can't really directly use um, variadic arguments yet. Maybe the language will be improved. Uh, so it's best just to convert them into MPL sequences. So the, the parser, when it actually runs, is just working on MPL sequences of types. Uh, so I'm continuing into the library. Um, as I said, um, it's using basically continuation style, which means uh, in MPL uh, you uh, you create a sequence, which is a, a pair of iterators. Uh, the iterator contains the entire current state, and when you increment that iterator, you're doing one computation and, and putting the new state into a new iterator. Um, I've handily just uh, grayed out all the noise. <laughs> um, so my my opinion is that uh, template meta programming really isn't all that bad a sequence except for type name and template. So I'm just create those out. Uh, you just think of type that as kind of like var uh, in other languages. It's just declaring a variable, um, and then the final. Um, well, this 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 one is different, but. Um, Usually, the final uh, uh, type depth of a of a struct is going to be type depth something type, which will be just like return. Um, so, uh, run the page is just going to take that sequence and keep on incrementing the iterator, which does each step until until it reaches the end. Um, so, in a way, this isn't really. Oh, all we really want to do is um, keep incrementing that iterator. And the way this iterator is implemented, um, the, uh, uh, if you dereference it by using type, you will just get the data from it. There's, um, there's a little bit more state in there. Just uh, I, you know, there's a special, a special done state, a very interesting, um, and a special end iterator. Um, so here we start looking at, at the actual data that's created for this uh, for this pushdown automaton. Um, we're going to have a stack. Each frame is going to have uh, the data, which is
by doing this. Um, so this was kind of my thesis from last year's talk, which is that graphs are actually more common in metaprogramming than they are in regular programming, <laughs> in regular runtime programming. Because uh, you can, a lot of people go through their entire career without ever programming a graph data structure. But in every language feature, uh, there, they, there are always tons of uh, graphs involved. Um, so some examples are just the control flow, uh, so data flow uh, call graphs. Um, you know, people use it directly in parallelization. So these are all examples of uh, compile time graphs. And um, so if you want to build a program uh, using a meta program, you're always going to run into graphs. It's um, thesis. So, um, so another other example are, are pointers between objects when you're plugging together different components. That's another sort of graph. Database schemas. State machines obviously are graphs. Uh, class hierarchies are graphs. Ownership containment graphs. Grammars, object syntax trees, and expression trees, all different sorts of graphs. So, uh, so uh, I'm trying to build a, a framework for all those kinds, for manipulating all those kinds of uh, metadata in order to build complex programs. Um, so. Uh, the general idea is that a type or a class can encapsulate any sort of program element, whether it's code or data or, um, or, or state um, or a rule of grammar. Um, and it just represents some sort of relation between those or some sort of process. So I believe that using graph metadata to describe programs will allow you to prove things about code better. Like for example, in um, the, so NPLDevGraph is, is currently being used in MSM in order to uh, find unreachable states um, and illegal, illegal uh, connections between uh, regions that shouldn't be connected. Um, uh, I, I believe that it can be used to structure code better, so um, so that instead of having all of this, all of that sort of graph structure just in your code, you can put it into a meta program, and it's more explicit. Um, and it's it can be used to generate these complex programs that you never be able to keep track of on your own. Um, so that's where I'm going with this. This is why I need. These languages, um, so I I wouldn't do this if I just needed one single graph language. I actually need a whole family of different graph languages, and I need languages for uh, higher order graphs, um, which are so one of the simplest example was a graph with different types of edges. Um, for example, a, a um, uh, bipartite graph where there's two different types of nodes and two different types of edges. You can usually implement these using a regular graph, but then you end up kind of overloading what what an edge means, and you have like horrible unions of like, well, it could be this type or that type of thing. Um, so I'm trying to actually uh, directly generate the data structures for implementing all sorts of higher order graphs. Um, that's where I'm going with this. So in terms of the languages, um, generally text can only represent, now this might not, <coughs> this, is this true with context sensitive languages? I know with, with a context free grammar, you can, only, you can only do hierarchical trees in text uh, directly. I think that's I think that's generally true of, of text. It's it's linear, but you can have you can have things grouped hierarchically, um, and then 
if those things happen to refer to each other, like if you have the same name in two different places, then you get a graph because you can kind of merge those things. So for example, if you if you have an abstract syntax tree and the same um, the same uh, what is it, what you call it? The same uh, variable shows up in two different places and you merge those two parts of the abstract syntax tree, then you get a graph. Um, so that's that's one direction I'm going with this. Um, but just in general, if you have, so like, um, I don't want to go back to the first slide, but <coughs> like um, the way that the way that uh, my EDSL. How long ago? Um, so the way that my EDSL is able to actually produce a graph, even though this is obviously just hierarchical data, is that, uh, for example, B is referred to within an edge, and so we can kind of merge. Uh, the identity of, of this just by using um, MPL map lookups um, or more generally by, by thinking of those um, textual elements as being the same. Um, so So, um, as I said, like almost actually almost all of the time, graphs are not really just graphs. Um, like in almost all real world applications, you're going to have multiple types of edges, or you're going to have um, even situations where there might be two different ways of looking at a structure where um, a node is a node in one view, and it's actually a graph in another view, or um, uh, or there's different different graphs overlaid, so that there's sort of a um, uh, so the node actually is 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 in two different graphs at once, and there's two different um, systems of relations, like okay, so concrete example, um, like when you're looking at, at objects, not only does um, an object, a class, have um, its hierarchy that it belongs to, it also contains objects. And so that's a two different graphs. And it also has pointers to objects. So it's a third different kind of um, metadata graph that, that that object belongs to. And so my general thing that I'm working towards with Metagraph is to represent those um, those kind of sort of overlaid graphs, sort of multifaceted uh, graphs in the most efficient way possible. Uh, so I hope next year to have a talk about that. Um, but uh, this year, all I wanted to point out is that uh, even though the the data structures for representing hierarchy graphs are difficult. It's very, very easy to end up in those situations with this text. So if you look at uh, just any random XML, it's usually going to be some kind of uh, graph with many types of edges and many types of nodes. Let's get back into the actual code. Um, let's look at just a single step in the uh, state machine. So as I said, um, this is the this is my style of, of meta programming. I think a, a lot of other people prefer to have just uh, a single expression really within within each meta function. But I I, I find it helpful to have intermediate states um, and kind of larger math functions like this. But really this is just like this is just like a regular function in, in C. I probably don't have to sell anyone here about on that, but um, really there's you're just 
this this could if I were if I weren't lazy, this would be a class, and that just the final line would be public. Um, and this type is the return. Um, so here's how we go through a single a single step in the in the um, in the um, push down automaton. Uh, so we're gonna look at the top of the stack. We're gonna fetch the current iterators from that, and then. If we if we're done with this particular sequence that we're looking at, we're going to finish this frame and basically pop something from the stack. Otherwise, we're going to um, we're going to follow up, uh, based on what we're looking at on this stack. So, push down the automaton is, is able to look at the current state and the current token in order to decide where to go next. Um, this is not actually a general push down the automaton because. Um, it's actually just pushing when it sees angle brackets, when it sees the template to recurse into. Um, but, um, uh, it could be, but, but, but considering that I think it's not um, So let's look at how we, how we follow a particular transition. This is this is just evaluating one uh, particular uh, token based on based on the current stack, the certain current state. So we're gonna uh, fetch the iterators and the and the, uh, uh, the from at the top of the current frame. So then, then it's going to see, well, is there, is there a curse rule for the current, um, for the, for the uh, transition with match? And if there is, then we're going to go into, into the, um, the recurse uh, follow-up. Otherwise, we're just going to go into the no recurse follow-up, um, which doesn't add anything to the stack. Um, so here's how no recurse works. It's actually just going to um, um, so it's actually just going to pop the top frame off the stack and push a new a new frame with the with the destination destination state. Um, so um, so the, it's going to create a new frame. Data is the effect of, of calling the um, of calling the semantic action on the current data. The uh, the the new state is going to be the target of that transition, and we're going to increment the uh, begin iterator so that we're just looking at the rest of the sequence. Uh, so let's look at how we actually recurse. Um, the first part of this is very similar because we're going to um, put. So this is just the this is just the first page of this function. Um, so it's going to this is almost the same. It's going to um, it's going to create a new frame. Um, the data is actually the same because we're going to do a post action when we're done with the recursion. The target state again. But what's different here is that we're going to put a new frame on the stack, um, and so we're going to we're going to grab the internal sequence, um, and 
we're going to create a new frame with with that uh, with those with the with that new sequence. Um, we're going to uh, call this semantic action. So this isn't um, like I said. This isn't really a generalized push down automaton. And one of the one of the problems with this approach is that it's actually it's got special cases for what what semantic action is when you go in and the one when you come out, and then it's also very um, it's very much tied to just using angle brackets. So this could um, for when it decides to reverse. So this could be generalized a bit. But, uh, uh, so so anyway, it's it's um, it's calling it's calling the uh, uh, semantic action for we're going into recursion uh, on the data. Uh, and there is some start data, which I think is a lot of So there's some start data, which is specified in the grammar, which is combined with the, um, with the outer data to produce the new state for the new frame. Here's how what we do when we get to the end. Um, you must actually be at. You must be in a finished state when you get to the end of a, of a sequence. <coughs> an assert. Um, uh, so again, we we uh, get the data. We pop the we pop the stack. Actually, popping twice because there was there was the the new the internal frame and then uh, the the frame of the the uh, one that we were turning into. We have to pop that one and push a new frame, which um, which. Uh, It's nice to see that those are straight lines. <laughs> um, so I I don't find this performance terrible. Um, so this is this is going up to um, this is parsing a graph of up to 63 nodes, and it's taking uh, six seconds on parsing 63 nodes. Um, uh, the memory usage is a little bit more atrocious using half a gig of memory to parse 63 nodes. Um, and as I understand it, you never really reclaim memory when you're doing that programming because all of those all of those template instantiations get kept around until until the compiler quits. So you may have to the translation unit. Yeah, so this is all one translation unit. So they may not be actually calling delete ever. It's again a bit yeah, there's really no garbage collection, I guess. <laughs> um, so all those templates just stay in memory. So, um, so I'm glad I have a 63 machine. Um, I, you know, I, I was, when we were working with um, that state machine, trying to get um, trying to get the, that verification stuff working, uh, I only had four state machines. Why does Why does it take like? Twenty times as long just to do a slightly larger problem. Oh yeah, it's fashion. Um, so um, I think there is just a slight curve to this, and I I don't have anything to back this up, but I would think that maybe that's because of that this relies really heavily on MPL map, which is not actually quite um, full form for all operations. Um, it was, it, was, <laughs> it was really wonderful to, 
you know, when I was learning that program, I'd be like, oh, wow, we have an O1 map. That's so cool. <laughs> but it's not actually an O1 for the So, uh, it would be nice to, it would be nice to profile this uh, more seriously and um, try to improve performance here. And let's see the connection. <coughs> Maybe actually having an explicit stack Slightly friendlier interface to have just um, to actually just use your cursive to send um, and to, to <coughs> specify the grammar directly rather than um, rather than the state machine. As I said, I'm just kind of not used to graphs, so that was the way I went about it. Um, so yeah, yeah. You looked at <coughs> when you make a mistake in your graph, you know, and it spits out some error message. Yeah. How easy is it to decipher where it came from? Um, so, well, no, sometimes you can put some asserts, static asserts, and things to make it yeah. much more friendly than. Um, I haven't, I haven't optimized that. I mean, certainly some of the cases, like, um, I think you saw the one, the one static assert that I've got in there. Yeah. Um, but I actually haven't found it. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm used to those error messages. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be hard to just add a static assert saying none of the transitions match, or um, you know, yeah, that would, that would be the one main error there. So what would happen if you made an edge to a node that wasn't actually in the graph? What you would define? Uh, I uh, the way that the way that MPL graph is implemented, it would just add the node. Oh. Um, so you don't actually have to specify all of your nodes. Um, it's just adding things to an MPL graph. So, um, so things I'm considering improving about this. So it's kind of either or, like either either maybe just go with the cursive descent because. Or, or generalize this to be a general push down function. As I said, it's actually just recursing when it, when it uh, re goes into a template, which is not that general. Uh, definitely want to improve performance and implement a meta graph, which is my actual goal on all this. Uh, <laughs> is my conclusion. Eventually, we will replace the compiler entirely. <laughs> uh, so my my opinion is that uh, meta programming should be first class in C plus um, meaning that instead of instead of a template uh, instead of implementing meta functions as classes with all this extra baggage of trying to do object layouts or something that's never actually going to be allocated um, that uh, it would be possible to just and and you could even simplify the sequence, uh, the syntax a little bit by just having directly meta functions using angle brackets um, in as a as a first class part of the language. I don't know how hard this would be, but um, this is kind of maybe one of my long term goals. Um, so I think it pretty much I can't almost every um, language feature that doesn't require special sequence syntax. I believe can be implemented as a meta program. But maybe I got this wrong. Can't you do this kind of thing today with C plus plus eleven with const extends? Uh, do for, do uh, which? Well, like basically write functions that are executed from so meta functions. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that. Um, so like this is an example of of doing parsing with a meta program, right. and so I think that eventually, well. Eventually, all the parsing could be done by a program. Mm -hmm. Eat its own tail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, 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 there's a lot of things like, uh, for example, virtual functions. Like, 
Maybe we don't really need virtual functions built into the language because it'd be pretty easy to implement that as a matter of program. Um, overloading, I believe, could be implemented as, as a matter of program. And, um, and you can kind of generalize each of these things and have maybe slightly different variations on all these things. Um, I, uh, the meta graph, okay? Oh, no, finish your um, So, um, I believe inheritance. So, so fusion is an example of kind of getting rid of con regular containment and, and getting rid of structs and having a nicer meta program, you know, a, an interface that's accessible from meta programming. Um, you know, fusion vector or fusion map is a nicer struct. Um, you might as well go ahead. Okay. So the idea of, of moving more and more semantics to meta. Yeah. It's very attractive to me. But I don't think C++ is a good platform for it. Um, because we're, we have so much legacy. Like, like think, you know, for example, this, this problem of uh, implementing overload <coughs> uh, at the meta level. The overload is with all of C++ files. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and so if you have to, to implement them as meta, I think we're going to have backwards compatibility issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I play with a different language that's where you can, you can change the grammar method. Yeah. Um, so it's completely operated, really. Um, yeah. But you can introduce buffer in there, get there, or overload with this is meta. And it's fun. Because oh, it's, oh, it's, it's something I work on. It's called Chrome, but it's not public. Yeah. 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 But it's not easy. You, even simple overload with machines is tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It does the virtual dispatch. I mean, dynamic, but not virtual. Uh, that, that's also meta, and that, that's easy. But there's a lot of stuff that the compiler does that when you try it, you say, well, I'll just, I'll just make that a library. It yeah. can be done, but you, know, you better have a good, uh, a good meta execution engine because it's not working. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's time for a new language, but I hope it would be as efficient as C++. And, right. and, and well, that's sort of surprising, right? Is that we, we have this, just a few languages today that are geared towards you know, hitting metal, and not popular. I mean, I'd, I'd hope that D would take off a little faster, but it doesn't. Um, but other than that, you've got C, C++, some communities, four chan you know, a few things, but well, we should be stuck with C++ for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that, um, one thing I find really attractive about C++ meta programming is that it is functional. Like, I, a lot of people are advocating Imperative meta programming, and I don't actually see why you'd want that because types actually are you just want to define them once and then move on. So, um, so I think that I think that the that, that you could improve the syntax and and uh, make those uh, angle bracket meta functions first class and have a very nice uh, may not be C plus plus but. So that was actually kind of my, my joke conclusion. But um, my real conclusion is that I believe that template meta programming is readable. Um, I hope that uh, by graying out all those extra templates and things, <coughs> I was able to make my code a little bit more readable. Um, my other conclusion is that basically you just end up with one general sort of design for all parsers um, and read parsers. Um, oh yeah, one of my digressions that I didn't get to was that um, uh, so I'm calling this reparsing. Um, although I was calling it meta parsing. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce the idea that meta should be used only when something is actually applied to itself. So, just because something uses meta programming, maybe it shouldn't be called meta. Just, uh, just, just maybe just because um, I grew up on a very liberal college campus, and so I kind of grew up with a little bit too much use of the word meta. Um, so, uh, I like I like to use it for that 
that very specific thing. Like so, so meta philosophy is the philosophy of philosophy, and linguistics is um, the study of how people understand language. Um, meta programming is programming applied to programming. Um, so, no, no insult to you, Apple, but meta parsing isn't actually a parser applied to a parser. <laughs> <laughs> meta parser is a parser applied to the same code as all on itself. Yeah, so that's why that's why I'm sort of that okay and calling it reparsing. It's it's been parsed once and now we're parsing it again with a meta program. But no no um, <laughs> I, 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 the reason the reason why that distinction comes up a lot for me is because people always think that MPL.graph is metagraph. Metagraph is this is actually a graph of graphs which I haven't implemented yet. Um, and um, so I'm trying to make that distinction where uh, so metagraph is, is, is a graph data structure uh, metadata graph um, structure applied to data structures it's not just using metaprogramming for graphs uh, mpl.graph is already out there it's in the it's right now a sub-library of MSM and I uh, am going to submit it for review. But really that's just that's just plain meta programming with graphs. It's not it's not the meta graph which I hope to have uh, uh, next year. Um, so uh, I just wanted to also say that these are almost practical. I mean you saw the performance. I think that taking ten six seconds to to parse a fairly large graph is reasonable. Um, half gigabyte of RAM, I think that's a, but, um, but I think this stuff can actually be done in a reasonable amount of time. I believe that um, Abel's, um, even, the, even the Haskell stuff, there should be an overhead for parsing the stuff, but then the meta programs that you get out of that shouldn't be showing that exponential um, Maybe David, Dave's um, suggestion that it was because of lazy functions. Um, so I mean, so one, so one feature of the way that, um, which is also common to to, to metaparse, um, when you, um, even though there is overhead of of creating a grammar. And you actually have to parse the grammar. Um, it sh it should create a meta program which is fairly efficient. So it's actually not, even though there's all these different levels of abstraction, um, there shouldn't actually be bad performance here. Cause, so with 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 uh, meta parse, there is the overhead of parsing. Um, so. Did, I, did when when you implemented the grammar for um, for that Haskell like language, did you use it using the uh, EVNF grammar or the mm -hmm. okay. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, but the parsing itself didn't have a huge overhead. It was the Haskell execution engine that yeah, exactly. that they were. So I, I think that I think that like. Um, there, there should be, there should be some overhead for these, for these abstractions. But then, you just kind of get past it, and then you end up with a regular meta program, which shouldn't be that inefficient. Um, and it would be good to, it would be good to learn uh, when lazy functions are inefficient, or if they have to be. They're certainly a lot nicer to look at because um, you have a lot less. It is kind of practical because I might have whatever it is, six or nine or twelve concept types in my geometry library, and uh, so we could uh, we could compile that with this to a graph where the refinement relationships are edges, and then I can say, does this thing eventually refine from this guy doing the graph graph diversal algorithm and make the make a new graph that gives that information directly? which would make the type system more extensible because then I could go 
to the graph I laid out and add a new concept type, say what it's a refinement of by making the direct edges, and then the whole system would just figure out automatically uh, where it can substitute. Right. And I was, I was talking with, um, uh, what's his name? Matt, Matt Calabrese when he was working on his, his concept implementation. Um, I, guess, I guess he's moved on to other things apparently, but, but he was going to use MPL graph in exactly the way that you're talking about. Yeah, he said he didn't quite have concept overloading yet, which is what I'm talking about, and that's the only feature of concepts I really care about. So. Yeah, yeah I, I, I believe it really would work. Now, have you, have you looked at whether real concepts would, would suffice for what you're doing? Well, obviously. They will, okay, good. Yeah. So yeah, this can be. Well, I thought that was really nice. That that was, that was in, uh, amazing. Uh, same same uh, thesis I was talking about a second ago. Matt was actually able to implement all, almost all the concepts just using that program. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, push the star. So. And that was nice to do. So. Um, any other questions? <laughs>